More and more churches are offering courses in what they call Christian yoga. Is there really such a thing as Christian yoga? Or have some sincere Christians been sincerely deceived? And how did a feature of a pagan Eastern religion get mixed in with Christianity in the first place? For some insights into these questions, stay tuned for an interview with a world-class expert on yoga. Lamb and Lion Ministries presents Christ in Prophecy, a program that focuses on the fundamentals of Bible prophecy, showing how current events in the news relate to biblical predictions of end time events and the soon return of Jesus. Now, here's your host, Dr. David Ray. Greetings in the name of Jesus, our blessed hope, and welcome to Christ in Prophecy. Once again this week my colleague Nathan Jones and I are delighted to have as our special guest one of Christendom's foremost experts on Eastern religions like Hinduism and Buddhism. Our guest is Carol Matriciana, a writer and video producer from California. Carol, welcome back to Christ in Thank Prophecy. Thank you very much for we having me. We are delighted to have you. And I tell you, Carol, that program we did last week was a real blockbuster. I still feel... Uh, tingling all over from your testimony about how you went to a place looking for drugs and found Jesus Christ. <laughs> Incredible story. Uh, in fact, uh, 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 Nathan, why don't you tell our viewers how uh, they can view that program on our website? Sure. Our website has many of our Christ and Prophecy episodes. Just click Multimedia and Television. Our programs are there, including the ones with Carol. Uh, during the week of broadcast, we'll actually have it on every page of the website. Just click the button. You can watch it right online. Well, Nathan, how about kicking off our discussion today? Sure. We're talking about yoga, and you're an expert. Can you tell us why you're an expert on yoga? Well, Nathan, I was actually born and raised in India for the first 20 years of my life, so I saw the practice of yoga. I wasn't involved in it because I realized it was Hinduism. I mean, in, in fact, in, in Hindu teaching, it is known that there is no yoga without Hinduism. There is no Hinduism without yoga. The two cannot be separated. It cannot be separated into spiritual exercise because the very point of yoga, which was designed in the Bhagavad Gita, which is the Hindu writings, the Hindu holy scriptures, they call it, the Bhagavad Gita, the actual God, the deity in there designed yoga for the individual to connect to his God consciousness. In Hinduism, they don't believe that you're a sinner. They believe that you're ignorant of your divinity. So the spark within you has to be ignited through yoga discipline. And um, in, in fact, another interesting thing is that it's believed that there is a lying, a coiled serpent asleep in each person waiting to be awakened through yoga disciplines. The serpent is known as wisdom, power, knowledge. And if that is brought up through the chakras, which are energy psychic centers, they call them, it's, a, it's metaphysics, it's not true, it's not scientific, uh, certainly not biblical, but the snake is brought up through self-hypnosis, through going within oneself, through breathing, through waking it up, through uh, disciplines, uh, repetitive saying the names of the deities again and again through repetitive things called mantras, repetitive prayer, through breathing, pushing it up till eventually it comes to the third eye, the sixth chakra, and then comes into the mind, into consciousness where you realize that you're divinity and you your connect divinity. that you are divinity huh. because within Hinduism, it's understood that divinity is in everything. God is in everything. Everything is divine, whether it's the rat on the street, the cow in the street, the monkeys in the trees, you. In fact, in, before every yoga class, you say namaste. That means in Hindi, the God within me bows to the God within you. So that is all an integral part of the spiritual discipline of yoga. And Brahman is understood to be a God consciousness, not a person. So when you say that you become God, in the Western world we see God, the God of the Bible, the Creator God, is a person and Jesus Christ, His Son, and the Holy Spirit, three persons in one, the triune God. That is not the case in Hinduism. In Hinduism it's a consciousness, it's a force, it's a thinking that you need to connect into. So in fact you need to alter your worldview. Did you ever become a practitioner of yoga? Yes, I so did. So you have experienced it firsthand, not just observing it. 
No, as I grew up in India, I observed it being practiced, but uh, in when I was about 19, 20, my parents returned mm -hmm. to England. I got involved in the New Age, which I didn't realize was a religious uh, mechanism to change our worldview into an Eastern mm -hmm. mystical worldview. So the New Age that I saw in the West was a completely polished, cleaned up, appealing, manipulative enticement into a different worldview. Did the yoga work in the, in the sense that it really can bring you into an altered state of consciousness? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It is a powerful spiritual What's practice. wrong with going into an altered state of consciousness? Well, you first of all, you give up your mind, yes. but you don't realize you're giving up your mind. <laughs> and the first commandment says that we need to love the Lord our God with all our heart and our mind. We're not allowed to put our mind into neutral mm -hmm. within biblical um, within the biblical mandate. In fact, uh, David talks about that I meditate on your law day and night. The Lord tells us to bind His law on our heads. So it's a mental rumination of meditating on the Word, which is quite different in the practice of yoga where you meditate on an experience. Mm -hmm. So you, you go into yourself and you imagine and you have subjective emotions about what you feel and it's very, very powerful. Wouldn't this open you up to demon possession or at least demonic attack? Well, I didn't know at the time, because I wasn't a Bible-believing Christian, that what I was getting involved in was opening doorways into the occult, opening doorways into demons. And is that I what that snake is? Is that a demonic spirit? Well, the snake is the master of all demonic spirits. It was the snake in Ezekiel and Isaiah and the stories we're told there where he says, I will be like the Most High. He acknowledges that there is a Most High. So the serpent, the Lucifer, the Good snake, point. knows there is a monotheistic God. But I will be like the Most High is that he introduces polytheism, many gods, the idea that we can all be like gods. And why not? Because we're in the Bible, we're told that we're children of God, but, and we're also told that we're created in His image, but we're not children of God until we come through Jesus Christ, through repentance. So what this is, is it's a counterfeit way through, of experiencing uh, uh, through creative manipulation, which is what Satan did. He was a liar. He said, I will be like the Most High. He created in his imagination a reality that doesn't exist. He cannot be the Most High. Now, Carol, a few years ago, uh, you went back to India and you produced a, a major documentary on yoga called Yoga Uncoiled. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, tell us about your experience there in India. Well, the reason I went was because Christians today are practicing yoga and it's being called Christianized yoga. Mm -hmm. It can't, that there is no such thing. It's like saying Christianized Hinduism. It's like saying Christianized occultism. Yeah, well, I want to get into that in a moment. I want you to tell us right now, what did you do in India? Well, I went to interview yogis. Okay. Those are the practitioners of yoga to say, can the spiritual discipline, the spiritual connections of yoga be separated from the physical exercises because okay. in America everybody's saying that they're just involved in yoga which they called flexing and stretching. And were, were they willing to be interviewed? Oh yes. Oh, in the mm. movie, in the movie you see in Yoga Uncoiled, okay. I interview not only the yogas, yogis in India, those are the yoga teachers in India and actually film classes going on and people that can explain what yoga means in India, but I also so then interviewed a Christian who teaches yoga. She's a pastor wow. in her church. Okay, this is fascinating. Yoga. I tell you what I want to do. I want to pause right now and show a clip from that uh, documentary called Yoga Uncoiled. Today in the West, about 35 million Americans are into yoga, just seeing yoga as a physical fitness. Yoga is a Hindu word. Yoga is a Hindu discipline to become one with the universal consciousness, which means become one with God. Which God? Brahma, the Hindu God. There are many various paths to yoga. Uh, in the sacred text of Hinduism called Bhagavad Gita indicates uh, three different paths. First of all, Bhakti Veda is a focus on a deity. Then Jnana Yoga is a focus on wisdom. Then the Karma Yoga 
is uh, based on your good deeds and actions. You have a number of yogas. Yoga is not one entity, but it has a wide variety of yogas. Uh, so, the, each yoga has a physical aspect and a spiritual aspect. The physical aspect is controlling the physical body. They control the breathing, they control the uh, mind, thinking activity, they control the physical movements, and so, uh, and the timely behavior to discipline the body in the morning, night, how to uh, control the bowel movement. These are all the forms of the physical part of the yoga. If you're practicing Jnana Yoga, or should I say a Raja Yoga, the primary focus of that te technique is to bring the mind into perfect stillness and to focus the mind in a very deliberate way on a particular uh, sound or vibration or image as it may be in the Tibetan Mahayana tradition of Buddhism that brings the, the mind into a state of quiescence, peace, such that revelation can occur, experiential penetration of a higher truth or another truth. So it's a way of manipulating the mind to generate different uh, experiences or insights or cognitions that are supposed to be connected to the apprehension experiential apprehension of higher realities. According to Hinduism, the highest reality is to become aware of one's own divinity. Hinduism respects everything as deity. The cows on the street, the monkeys in the city, the idols which are half men, half animal like creatures. But the highest goal is realization of one's personal divinity or God consciousness. This realization can be experienced through direct perception deep within one's own mind, a place known as the seat of concentrated wisdom, an area between the eyebrows which is known as the third eye. It is also called the sixth chakra, meaning wheel, and recognized as psychic energy. The other chakras are said to run along the spine starting at the bottom blossoming at the top, meeting at the agna, meaning command. Here at the agna, the third eye is the central point where all experience is gathered in total concentration and is also believed to be the base of all creation itself. In this hotel where I was staying, each morning the local priest would come to offer the morning puja or prayer rituals to the gods. He'd prepare arti, the celebration of light through fire, and mix the vermilion red mixture for bindi or kumkum, the dot seen between the eyebrows. This bindi or kumkum is believed to retain psychic energy in the human body and control the various levels of concentration. Here, the hotel manager explains that the bindi or kumkum and arti fire are being prepared not only for the gods, but also the hotel guests who are esteemed as gods. For our gods, we place this kumkum as a tradition. Okay? The guests are a god. The guests who are coming in here are our gods. Okay? So we keep the bindi, we do the arati and the bindi for the guests. They are like our gods. Uh, in Hinduism, they have more than 330 million gods. That means everything is God. Whatever you see, whatever you touch is God. And uh, the sun God, the moon God, and all, all, everything is God. So man and nature, man and animal are one. Welcome back to Christ and Prophecy in our interview with Carol Matriciani, the producer of the video Yoga Uncoiled. Carol, uh, I want to get into our discussion in this segment by reading you a statement that was made recently by Albert Moeller, who is the president of uh, Southern Theological Seminary in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, he spoke out against uh, the practice of yoga and he generated a storm of controversy. Uh, as you know, yeah, this I is a very imagine. controversial. <laughs> and he said this, quote, the idea that the body is a vehicle for reaching consciousness with the divine is not Christianity. Christians who practice yoga must either deny the reality of what yoga represents or fail to see the contradictions between their Christian commitments and their embrace of yoga. What is your response? Well, their embrace of Eastern mysticism, that's exactly what it is because mm -hmm. yoga was specifically designed for a purpose within Eastern mysticism. One, to awaken 
the idea that we are divine and that divinity is within us and we are one with everything. The second is to shorten our reincarnation cycle, to prepare us for our reincarnation cycle. That's the purpose of yoga. Cycle. The purpose <laughs> of yoga is to teach you how to die in order that you can come back in your next life as a better person. It's suicide? So it's suicide. <laughs> yoga is suicide. It is, an, it is a discipline to prepare you for death in the, within the context hmm. of Hinduism, which believes that your spirit, that you don't die, that you come back again and again and again. In fact, Gandhi said that reincarnation is a hopeless cycle of imprisonment. The Hindu knows they cannot get out of reincarnation, that they're going to be born again, die again, born again, die again. So why, my question would be to a Bible-believing Christian that understands that Jesus Christ died because we were separated from him through our sins. He died in order to give us reconciliation with life for eternity, we've got reconciliation through Jesus Christ. Why practice a discipline designed for death? So basically what you're saying is that the term Christian yoga is an oxymoron. Well, like a lot of things in the new emerging <laughs> Christianity, that's exactly what it is. It's Christianized occultism, Christianized Hinduism. Uh, in fact, in my movie, Yoga Uncoiled, the Hindus uh, are very angry with Christians that try and steal their religion and Christianize it. Mm -hmm. And yet Christians will say, well, I can separate it. I can actually do, uh, uh, I, I only do the spiritual exercises. But let's question that. I, I play tennis. I don't play Christian tennis. <laughs> I, 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 we do exercises for our body and we can do gymnastics and flex and stretch. That, that's called gymnastics. The moment you call it yoga, yoga means to yoke, to unite with God consciousness. Many of the positions used within yoga are the names of the deities. Those positions are called asanas. And those positions are a deity that you become and you merge with within an Eastern worldview. So if they want to do stretching and flexing, which I do every time before I play tennis, I think about the muscle I'm pulling, I think about the muscle I'm stretching, I think about the position I'm going in order to you know, do the appropriate stretching. I don't think of a cobra, which is one of the positions in yoga. Is that cobra. that three, third finger thing where they sit like that? You know that, what? Or? You shouldn't do a mudra like that. <laughs> well, well, tell me why. Why shouldn't I do that? Because that is believed to be part of the prayer that you pull in the vibrations, you hold your hand in a particular way, and you say that word, Om, which is a vibration of a God. Because wow, everything is God thing. consciousness, our positions, our repetitive prayers, which are called mantras, you say the name of the deity, and they believe that the vibrations saying Om connects you to the vibration that began the world. You see, the basis of yoga is evolution. And evolution is the faith of Hinduism, that everything is becoming better. If you are a Bible-believing Christian, you understand that nothing is getting better. We're on a decline. We're getting worse. Yes. There are two opposing worldviews. Yoga is designed to make you feel better because they believe it's encouraging the divinity within you to realize that you're God consciousness. Actually, you're getting involved in a lie. It's deception. Why not? Just do good physical exercises, and Paul said that it profit our body a little bit to do a little bit of spiritual, a uh, little bit of physical discipline. That's fine, but then why don't we meditate on incredible things that God has done for us, mm -hmm. which is what it's all about, on the promises of God, and not put your mind into a vacuum, no. into an experience of wanting to make yourself feel better so that you can come into the presence of God. Now, when I was a Roman Catholic, we practiced the presence of God. That is, when you go into a Roman Catholic church and the red light is burning on the altar, that is to tell you that the Eucharist, the piece of bread there, has been made into the actual body of Jesus Christ. And so when you come into the church and make the sign of the cross, you are practicing the presence. You are walking in a mystical worldview with your mind and reason telling you that that piece of bread is actually Jesus that is going to be crucified or die again uh, during mass or has been left over from mass and is up there. So 
in a mystical way, I feel the presence of Jesus. When I became a Bible-believing Christian, I had to toss that out. I had to repent of those feelings and now rely on the promise which says that Jesus will never leave me. It is a completely different walk of faith versus experience, experiencing through subjectivity. Now, I may not feel like I'm in the presence of Jesus when I walk by faith, but Jesus said he would never leave me. He will never leave me alone. He's my comforter. He's the lifter of my head. He's my bulwark. He's my sustainer. He's my sufficiency. Those are the promises I have to depend on in faith. Well, Christian meditation never consists of emptying your mind to become a vacuum. Mm -hmm. It would be meditating on Scripture, reading mm -hmm. Scripture and thinking about Scripture. And the character of God. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. David said that quite a lot. Meditate on God's Word day and night, but not the meditation that yoga is teaching, right? Well, no, it's the meditation on the character of God. How good you've been to me, God. How merciful you are to me. Thank you for dying to give me eternal life. Thank you. I'm a worm. I've been separated to, from you by sin. Whereas in Hinduism, you're not considered a worm. You're considered divinity, divine. You've got to awaken it. And you mustn't have a low self-esteem of yourself within Hinduism and Eastern mysticism. You just have to go to India to see this doesn't work. In India, there is huge poverty, huge... Mass starvation. Depression. If yoga worked in India, these people would be elated. <laughs> They're not. That's right. Welcome back to our interview of Carol Matriciana. We've been talking about the danger of any Christian practicing the Hindu technique of yoga. Carol, let's uh, close up our show. Uh, could you show us the significant differences between Christianity and Eastern religions? Well, in Eastern mysticism, there's no such thing as sin. It's your ignorance that you are divine. See, in biblical Christianity, the whole concept of having a relationship with Jesus Christ is based on me being a sinner. But God loved me so much, he didn't want me separated from him for all eternity. He sent his only begotten son so that through him, my sins might be forgiven and I can be reconciled back to him. In Hinduism, the only recon reconciliation, if you will, is because they see death as a hopeless cycle of imprisonment. So the only reconciliation is for you to come back better the next time round through the practice and discipline of yoga. So you can somehow be a better sinner. I, I hate to say it like that, but That's within beautiful. biblical Christianity, we believe that you're a sin is a sin, you're a sinner. In Hinduism, they think you can be a better person. With the, what, the guru being the, the most holy or the most sinless of their group? Not really. The guru is a God-man. The guru has, has connected with his enlightenment that he is God, and he wants all his devotees to connect to their divinity and realize that they're God, because that way they can then control their death, their destiny. Well, there's no such thing. We can't control our, desti our destiny. But you see, we have to come back to the serpent, who is the initiator of Hinduism. The serpent told Eve, surely you won't die. The Hindu's idea of reincarnation is surely you won't die. So right. it's the procrastination of death that I can come back better in my next life, in my, in my next life. So I think that is a huge difference. There in Eastern mysticism, you're connecting to a God force. With us through biblical Christianity, we connect, we are reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, which is a personal relationship, a person. Hinduism doesn't believe that um, there's, that there's any such person out there. It's a universal God in everything, everything is divine concept. Pull you up by your own bootstraps and save yourself, basically. Yes, Whereas yes. in Christianity, we need a savior to save us because we can. Uh, that, and that's the primary difference. Okay. And, and, that, and that death has been conquered for us. In Hinduism, it, it hasn't been. It's ongoing. It's reincarnation. And I think another thing, when Christians get involved, they say, oh, I've heard lots of people say to me, well, I only did it once and then I didn't feel right. The reason they didn't feel right is because they opened themselves up to demonic spirits. That uh -huh. must be confessed. In order for a Christian to have a life relationship of fellowship back 
with the Lord, go to 1 John 1, 9, which says, if we confess our sin, then he who is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sin will cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Go to the Lord, say, Lord, I've sinned. I got involved in something that I was ignorantly involved in. I didn't realize I was opening myself up to demonic spirits. I confess my sin. Lord Jesus, at that point, you're forgiven. You're back in fellowship. But um, if you allow that those demons to come in within Hinduism, uh, those demons become our familiar spirits. They're familiar. We, we, as Christians, we say, well, I didn't really sin. I didn't really do that bad. That's a familiar. You either sinned or you didn't. You're either <laughs> pregnant or you're not. You know, yeah. it's like, that's yeah. it. So we have to come back to the fact that to realize I'm a sinner, yes, I tangled with the occult world. It's like, well, I kind of sort of played with Ouija boards, but I didn't really <laughs> sort do of it. Kind of played you know, no, you, you, you became involved in a vehicle that takes you into mm. a demonic world where they want to possess you. So you have to come out as a Christian, whether you've practiced it once or for years and years and years, it doesn't matter. It's in, according to the Bible, we have to call evil, evil. Well, Carol, I hate to say it, but our time is almost up. And I want people to uh, find out more about uh, your ministry. And uh, I know one way they can do that is to get on your newsletter or mailing list where you discuss all these issues. It's free of charge. How about telling our viewers how they can do that? Well, they can go onto my webpage, www.caril, my name is spelt a little differently, C-A-R-Y-L-T-V.com, seven letters, C-A-R-Y-L-T-V.com. And uh, there they can preview um, many of the 60 movies that we've Great. produced and get the book. Well, thank you, Carol. And I tell you, it, it's been so exciting to uh, talk with you that we're going to invite you back for a third week oh, and okay. kind of shift things a little bit. We're going to talk about the impact of Eastern religion upon Christianity in America, particularly in the apostate emergent church movement, which has been heavily impacted by Hindu type thinking. And I know you're making a major video production on that right now, which is called what? The Wide is the Gate. Wide is the Gate. Mm -hmm. And so we'll have you come back next week to discuss that with us, and uh, we look forward to that. Well, folks, that's our program for this week. I hope it's been a blessing to you. I'm sure it has. And I hope you'll be back with us next week when Carol Matriciana will discuss the dangers of the emergent church movement. Until then, this is Dave Reagan speaking for Lamb and Lion Ministries saying, look up, be watchful, for our redemption is drawing near. If you enjoyed today's program, you will like the video, Yoga Uncoiled, a revealing look at the growth of yoga throughout the Western world. Video journalist Carol Matriciana, who was born and raised in India, returns to her native land to search for truth among India's leading experts and examines what Christian yoga practitioners in the West are saying about their yoga participation. Once viewed by Christians as a pagan import from the East, yoga has now become mainstream in the church and has advertised to improve spirituality and experience God's presence. But is yoga's mysticism compatible with historic Christianity? With critical discernment, this hard-hitting and informative DVD explores the ramifications of dismissing yoga's core spirituality and blending biblical terminology and precepts with Eastern meditative techniques and practices. To get your copy of Yoga Uncoiled for a gift of $15 plus shipping, go to lamblion.com and place your order. Or if you prefer, call the number you see on the screen and we'll gladly take your order over the phone. Thank you for joining us on today's Christ in Prophecy, a presentation of Lamb and Lion Ministry, a non-denominational ministry dedicated to teaching the fundamentals of biblical prophecy and proclaiming the soon return of Jesus.